thank everyone for joining us today for Dementia Friendly Tempe Presents. My name is Candace Hewitt, and I work for the City of Tempe as a Senior Social Services Coordinator. I'm responsible for the Dementia Friendly Tempe programs, such as Memory Cafe and these monthly presentations. These presentations are scheduled on the second Wednesday of each month. Each presentation has a different topic related to caring for a loved one living with dementia. For more information on future presentations, please visit our website at www.tempe.gov DFT. All participants will be emailed a PDF of the PowerPoint after the presentation, and the PDF is also posted in the chat. I will also send out the link to view the video if I have, as long as I have your contact information. If I don't and you want to put it into the chat with your name and email, please do that. Next slide. Before we begin, I would just like to go over some housekeeping. Like many of you, we've moved our connection with the community online and we're experiencing a bit of a learning curve as we shift our in-person presentations to a virtual format. So please bear with us. Today's presentation is what every caregiver needs to know about legal and financial planning. And our presenter is Marsha Goodman. Marsha is a certified elder law attorney and I'll let Marsha introduce herself in more detail when she begins her presentation. To cut down on noise and distractions during the presentation, all participants are muted. If you move your cursor on your screen, a bar will appear with several icons, including your video and microphone icons. If you look at your microphone icon, you'll see a slash through it, which indicates that you're muted. If you unmute yourself, just click on the microphone eye contact, and when you're finished speaking, click on the icon again to mute yourself. Our presenter will pause for questions throughout the presentation. If you want to ask a question, just click on the raised hand icon to indicate you have a question, and we'll call on you during the question time. Just remember to unmute yourself. If you prefer, you can type your question into the chat function by clicking on the word cloud icon on the same icon bar on your screen, and I'll relay your question to the presenter for a response. So with no further delays, I'll turn it over to Marsha to start the presentation. Marsha. Thanks, Candace. Um, I certainly don't want to take up your time introducing myself, but I am, as Candace said, I'm a certified elder law attorney. Um, my practice with the law firm of Fraser, Ryan, Goldberg, and Arnold. My practice is focused on exactly the kinds of things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, I work with uh, seniors and their families uh, to help them find, get, and pay for the care they need and their various legal um, requirements related uh, to that. Um, I did want to say something real briefly about the recording. Um, I'm really glad that Candace is recording because I know it's a lot of information and I talk really fast. Um, and I'll try to be mindful of that. And um, sometimes you're going to want to listen to it again later or maybe share it with family members who are not. Um, present with you right now. Just remember that this is not legal advice per se. That would be tailored to someone's specific circumstances. So it's not necessarily intended to, you know, share with other friends and neighbors who who might ask a question that really is a memory aid um, for all of us uh, to try and keep track of with what's going on. Um, so we're going to start with some of the legal documents that, you know, we um, the heading is what uh, people need to know planning for dementia, but really every adult should have these documents. So um, uh, what are powers of attorney and healthcare directives? You know, who should have them and why? Um, not just the person with dementia, but remember the caregiver. Um, what do those documents accomplish and what do they not accomplish? And how do you keep them current? So let me do a little overview on that. So a durable power of attorney, sometimes that's called a financial power of attorney, is the document in which you appoint someone to handle your financial activities when the principal is not able to do so him or herself. And, um, you know, Marsha, you're muted. Have I been muted all this time? No, just for maybe 20 seconds. 
God, I didn't even touch anything. Anyway, who knows? <laughs> so as an aside, someone asked me if I was nervous about the, doing this, and my answer was only the technology makes me nervous, um, as you can see. Anyway, so a durable power of attorney um, is, uh, when you, as I said, appoint someone to handle financial activities. And as I was saying, uh, folks sometimes will come to the office and a husband will look at a wife and say, I'm not old enough for that. But, you know, all we have to do is look at the news and the awful wrong way accidents that we see on the news. Things can happen to anyone at any time, even just for a temporary or short period of time, where you would need someone to step in and make sure that your bills are paid or be able to talk to the custodian of your 401k so that you could begin to withdraw money. So this really is something, as I said, that everyone should have. What makes that power of attorney what we call durable? Um, usually that term is in the heading or the title, but it doesn't need to be. The magic words are if it says, this power of attorney continues in effect, even if the principal becomes disabled. And so that's a sign to third parties that someone who may lack capacity at the present time um, may, intended when he did sign it, that this document could be used and he could be giving this authority to people even after they become incapacitated. And I want to touch as a reminder there also, as I in the opening slide, it said not just for the person with dementia, but for the caregiver. So often a couple will come in and each of them has named each other as the agent under the power of attorney. So for the person with dementia, he's all set. He has named his spouse who is healthy and you know and has capacity and she can take care of everything. But if something were to happen to that spouse, again, even for a short time, then her agent is the person who lacks capacity. So remember that if you are, if someone is diagnosed with dementia and you realize now is a good time, while that person still has capacity to prepare powers of attorney, both spouses um, should make sure those documents are in effect. Um, and although I say on here, uh, um, consider a springing power of attorney that doesn't go into effect until the person with the, the principal, the person who created the document, um, is disabled. That's not really my favorite, um, and I'll explain why. So it has language in it that says this power of attorney does not become effective until usually it's two doctors or my primary care physician and another doctor claim that I lack capacity. So. What 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 makes me uncomfortable about that is um, so sometimes it's necessary in a very short time frame, in an emergency type time frame, for the person, the agent, to be able to do something on behalf of the principal. And that sort of language requires time expended to get a hold of those doctors, have them complete the forms, and so forth. Um, and, 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 you know, sometimes in that situation, there really isn't time. But what actually, for me personally, what I don't like about them is the invasion of privacy. So there's a number of reasons why someone might be acting using someone else's power of attorney. I often talk about my mother who was very frail, but mentally competent. So if she could handle something on the telephone, she took care of it. But if it was necessary to go somewhere, that was very challenging for her. And so I would, you know, using her power of attorney, go to various meetings and so forth and take care of things for her. So first of all, she didn't lack capacity, but if she did, then those letters that say the person lacks capacity need to be attached to that power of attorney doc document. So you are giving every banker, trust officer, person in the brokerage house, these letters saying that the principal lacks capacity. So those are the two reasons why that is not my preference. On the other hand, sometimes folks are very um, uncomfortable giving that authority and they want it in effect for an emergency, but they don't want someone having that authority before. Um, the person loses capacity. And in that case, I am in support of let's have the springing power of attorney rather than no power of attorney at all. And then a reminder that the power of attorney document expires on when the person passes away. When the person signs it, has passed away, then that document is no longer valid, um, cannot be used for final arrangements or any of those sorts of things. 
Um, the next is a set of health. What are the other documents people should have? The healthcare powers of attorney and advanced directives. That is usually a set of documents um, that express the principal's wishes about medical care and appoint someone to advocate for her when the when the principal herself is not able to do so. Um, and we'll go through those in detail, but they include the living will, a medical power of attorney, a mental health power of attorney, a pre and a pre-hospital medical care directive, um, what we sometimes call a DNR. And again, every adult should have to select the person they want to uh, make those choice decisions for them and document their wishes so others don't have to guess. So medical directives, again, are the pre-hospital medical directive, what you might think of as the orange form. It has to be printed on orange paper. Um, it's signed by either the principal or it can be signed by the person with the power of attorney for the principal and a medical professional, a doctor or nurse. And um, this is basically an instruction to first responders to say, if I go into cardiac arrest, I do not want to be resuscitated. You'll often, you know, I have many clients in senior communities. You'll often see these on the door jam, on the refrigerator, very visible in their living space. Because if it's not seen right away, if someone should call 911 for a person who has signed one of these, and the first responders come and they don't see the orange form, they're going to do what they need to do. And you would not then say, oh, now I found the orange form, so we're going to, to use that expression, pull the plug. Um, and then another uh, similar document is a DNR, a do not resuscitate, which is a, a physician's order. So that is something that's in uh, the chart of someone who's in the hospital often. That similar effect, that if this person goes into cardiac arrest, they, have, they or their uh, agent under the power of attorney has made it clear that that person does not want to be resuscitated. It really covers that very narrow situation. It doesn't give guidance, and we'll get to what does give that guidance, for other kinds of treatment, other kinds of choices that might be made about whether you know certain other treatments should be um, administered. So sometimes I'll ask someone, do you have a living will? And they'll say, I have a DNR, and I'll explain it's not the same thing. Um, the healthcare power of attorney is a document in which, similar to the general power of attorney, you appoint that person to make medical and end of life decisions when the principal is not able to make or communicate those decisions. And unlike the general or financial power of attorney, which can have effectiveness even when the principal has capacity, this only applies when the person lacks capacity. If you know any of us watching this session, um, we've named someone as our power of attorney, um, and we so uh, and we're aging or we're frail, we're in a wheelchair. Still, we can express ourselves what we want and don't want, and they need to look to the person, him or herself, not some agent that they named. I think we all see that sometimes with seniors where, you know, the uh, daughter will go to the doctor with mom and the doctor looks only at the daughter. You know, we have, no, my, my mom knows what's going on and talk to her. You know, I'm just the driver. Um, you know, we sometimes we need to emphasize that, but the person with capacity has the always has the ability to make his or her own decisions about this very important issue. Now with someone, it's one thing to say if someone has had a stroke, they're not conscious, then it's easy to see if they can express themselves or not. With dementia, as you know, not so easy. It's a little bit of a sliding scale um, when the person can express themselves, but do they really understand uh, the questions? Can they make informed consent based on their cognitive ability? So I don't mean to minimize the challenges there, but I just wanted to touch on that. Um, in Arizona, has separate mental health language. Um, oh, well, I'm gonna get to that question in a minute. Um, uh, has a, a separate mental health language, either a separate document, um, and if you, uh, the attorney general's website has a separate mental health power of attorney, or like I know the DUNS that I prepare in my office um, has just a section dealing with the mental health situation and it's signed separately, where you, the person, the principal is naming an agent, someone who could admit that person to a level one, to a behavioral health hospital. Um, so it's not the ability to agree to behavioral health outpatient or medication. 
the, the standard healthcare power of attorney applies to that. It applies only to the admission of the behavioral health hospital, uh, such as the SAGE unit or um, um, Haven Senior Horizons. Those are a couple of geriatric um, uh, psychiatric hospitals. And we're, I think we're all familiar with the, the situation that does occur often with sometimes someone does be, have a situation to need to be admitted to those kinds of facilities. Sometimes from an infection, uh, a person has short-term delirium and that's the appropriate treatment for them. And so you are saying you're naming an agent to make that admission decision in addition to the healthcare. And, and this one, um, sometimes people think, well, I don't want to, I'm not gonna let them do that because they're just gonna lock me away. Um, I remind folks that those behavioral health hospitals are not, it's not a hotel. The person still needs to meet the criteria for admission there. You cannot, you know, drop your loved one off because you're angry or tired of them. Um, and, the, and the flip side of that is if someone needs to be admitted into that kind of environment, there are ways to accomplish that um, that are quite burdensome for the family as opposed to choosing uh, the person that you would want. Now, let me check a question that came up. Um, oh my goodness, uh, somebody asked, when is it too late for the person with dementia to appoint someone as their decision maker? Um, oh my gosh, I wish I knew the answer to that. But certainly when someone is first diagnosed, so the, and we talk a little bit about capacity a little bit later on, um, but you know, capacity is different for different purposes. So someone may, their dementia may be way too far advanced to read a 20 page real estate document and the CCNRs and all of that stuff that's attached to it. Um, but if you were to say to that person, if I were to meet with that person and say, um, you know, this is a document where you're going to name the family member who um, can help you make medical decisions if you can't do them, who would you want to do that? And they say, well, my wife. OK, OK, I understand that. What if maybe your wife wasn't around? Well, our daughter always helps us. I want it to be my daughter. In my mind, that person has the capacity to execute the power of attorney. They understood the issue. We obviously it wasn't like it wouldn't be like, hi, how you doing? And that's the first question I ask. You know, we have a little bit of a conversation where I get the sense that they understand why we're, they're in a lawyer's office and so forth. Um, and memory is not the same as judgment. So just because a half hour later, we might have, have that same conversation in the same words, it doesn't mean that they did not understand their choice. Um, so I can't really, it's certainly not based on the diagnosis alone. Um, and I know that many times the uh, professionals, when someone is first diagnosed, often says, which is excellent advice, if you don't have these documents at this time, now is the time. Um, but I guess it really is when that person can have a, coherent discussion and appear to understand um, what their what their choice is. You know, when I say to someone, if the family comes to me and I'll say, can your um, can your dad sign documents? And they say, well, he'll sign whatever I put in front of him. That isn't really what I meant. And if that is all that that person can do, then that then it is unfortunately too late for that person. Um, what's a living will? is um, that's the document in which you document your wishes regarding end of life treatment for, if you're not able to express them at the time. So I th there's some forms where almost like check the box, whether you would like, um, you know, if you just want to be kept comfortable or if you, you know, if it, again, this is only after you are unable to effectively express yourself. Um, and so you might say, I do not want, I, I would be okay with a feeding tube, but I never want to go on a, a ventilator or a trach or artificial breathing. I don't ever want an artificial, um, you know, heart activity. As specific as you want to be for what you would want to happen if you are at a point where you cannot express yourself and the doctors determine um, that you, you know you're you're at a point where it's unlikely that you would recover, and I often think of this document as a roadmap for the person who has your healthcare power of attorney. If 
if a family is meeting with the doctors, the hospital, when someone is at the end of life, they will look to that person who has the power of attorney. They won't say, oh, let me see what they said here. They will sort of expect that agent to be acting on that person's behalf. That is your obligation um, as the agent under a power of attorney to act the way you know that person would have wanted, not your personal opinion. Um, and, you know, the more specific that you are able to be, the more helpful that is. There is also language related to dementia, because sometimes, uh, uh, especially with feeding, um, someone with advanced dementia may be able to take food in her mouth and swallow it. But, you know, if they're fed, uh, almost like a, a baby would have been fed, but they're not able to sort of actively feed themselves. They are not able to express that they want nutrition. And there is some language that I have clients who have chosen um, to basically say if they are at that point with dementia, that they no longer want to be have food administered to them if they're not able to ask for it and or feed it to themselves. So again, this is not saying if someone says I'm hungry or expresses that they're hungry or they want something that you're denying it, but they're not at the point where they can even express that they want it. Those kinds of, of um, specific information that you might include in there about what you would want. Um, other uh, documents, oh, I wanna touch on one thing with powers of attorney real quick and I'll leave this slide up. A new law was just signed um, last month. And so we'll go into effect 90 days after the governor signed it. So that'll be sometime in August uh, to make it clear that an agent under a power of attorney cannot keep uh, people, persons with a significant relationship. Unfortunately, as an attorney, I can envision the litigation that would come from this. But so person, the one brother who has the power of attorney cannot keep his sister from seeing mom and dad in le you know, unless mom had said sometime previously that, you know, I'm fed up with my daughter and I never want to see her again, um, that those kinds of isolating behavior by the agent with the power of attorney, um, they're not permitted to do that. And, and, and the other person, the daughter, could bring a court action to require the contact. I hate to think of that scenario. Unfortunately, we see things like that in our office. But I mentioned that because another thing you may want to document, and there's no particular format for it, um, but even on a piece of paper is, you know, to say to your your son, you know, like, I know your sister bugs you. I know you never, you'd be just as happy to never see your sister, but she's my daughter and I want her to be able to come see me even when I'm not able to say so. Just another, uh, you know, thing that you might want to document or, or make sure is documented so that others can't impose their will on the will of the principal. Uh, other couple um, expressions or of intentions, as I said, are prearranged funeral, a cremation directive, um, if you want to be cremated, you should document that yourself. If a, uh, if a person dies and they're married, the spouse can make that decision. But if the person has children and they didn't document it, it takes the majority of the children to agree. Um, so that's why it's good to document your wishes or any other wishes, you know, where you want to be buried if you've moved and, and those sorts of things. And then, of course, an ethical will, a legacy of your values. In the end of the presentation, there's a list of some websites. And there's something called the five wishes, which is a workbook for documenting, you know, we are certainly way more than our stuff. And so um, what are the values and principles and so forth that we want to impart to our loved ones that we want them to remember about us? Um, that's something that you may want to document as well. And so what if you don't have powers of attorney? Um, if, if someone does not have powers of attorney and they cannot speak for themselves, then a guardian is appointed uh, by the court to make decisions about health care and living arrangements, and a conservator would be appointed uh, to make decisions about financial matters for that person. Um, and this is, it's not pleasant, it's expensive, it's public, you know, now that court is by, um, go to meeting just like this. It's maybe not as public, but I think eventually we'll be back in the courtroom and people are in the gallery who are not your family watching the goings on. Um, and it requires a finding of incompetence by the court. So the court looks at medical advice 
and medical documentation and says this person lacks capacity, is unable to make decisions for him or herself, and we are going to appoint a guardian and or conservator for that person. And, you know, I often say to folks, once you open that courthouse door, you, there's no control. So the the daughter who has always cared for you might petition to be the guardian, but because all the children have to be provided notice, you never know who's going to show up and 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 fight about it. And it's just not what anyone ever wants to choose. And I touched on this before um, in response to the question about when might it be too late, but competency is really a legal decision, not a medical one. So even when in your power of attorney, a springing power of attorney, it says when two doctors say I lack capacity, that's because the legal document said this is how I'm going to define competency or capacity. And as I said, there's different standards for different purposes. Um, this is the reason for the law that if someone over 65 buys a car, they have a, I think it's 48 hour cooling off period to say, never mind, I don't want it. Um, and that contractual uh, capacity is really the highest standard. Um, and then the sliding, uh, you know, a, a continuum to powers of attorney to testamentary capacity, which is someone, um, the law says a person can create a will if that person has a, uh, a, a donative intent. It's the intention of that person to describe how they're going to bequeath their property. They have a general understanding of the property that they have. And, and, and they express that that's what they want to do and they name a, a, an executor. Um, so that's a relatively low standard along the way in there. So this is one of the, I just wanted to stop here and see if there are any questions about powers of attorney or any of that that we were talking about. Oh, I grab a sip too. Well, I, don't I don't see anything, anything in the, in the chat. chat. Somebody, somebody question wants to raise their hand. Okay, I will just go on. I just have one slide on this. This could be its own seminar sometimes. Um, but I just wanted to touch on sort of the standard estate planning documents because we did talk about the documents that folks should have. So um, a, a last will and testament. Again, the, a testator must have capacity, um, him or herself, to create the document. A will is something that cannot be drafted or changed by an agent under a power of attorney. It is considered to be so personal that someone else, that it's authority that you can't um, designate. Now the test, the intentions can match what the statutory shares are. They can be something different. Um, and when I say the statutory share, so if someone doesn't have a will, um, then the law sets forth what happens. If someone is married um, and um, then if, if married, if they have children who are all the children of the spouse, then if they pass away, then everything goes to the spouse. If they have children who are not the children of the spouse, then half goes to the spouse and half goes to the children who are not the other children. If they're not married and have children, then it's just the children. No children, then it's parents if they're living. If it's no parents, then it's the descendants of your grandparents. So then it's your siblings or then your cousins. So it, when people talk about that, if you don't have a will, it goes to the state, uh, to the state. That is one of the options, but that's a long list of other people. There's a long list of your parents and your siblings and your nieces and nephews and cousins. Um, there's an effort to find relatives, but obviously, you know, um, what's best is to have chosen to specify um, who you want to have your assets when you pass away. And even if there's other ways to I'll talk to the trust in a second, but sometimes, you know, we don't have that much in our quote unquote estate. We, in our retirement accounts um, or life insurance, we name a beneficiary. And those assets are gonna pass to that beneficiary regardless of what it says in your will. So, um, so you, if everything that you have is in retirement accounts, which is more and more common um, these days, then uh, you don't necessarily need a will to pass those assets, but it's just helpful to have named that executor or in Arizona, we call that person the personal representative. There are always things to be tied up 
that you want to give that person the legal authority they need to to square things away and do what needs to be done. I mean, the example I always use, and I wish it would go away, but it isn't, is if you know you want so someone lived alone and they pass away, and so you want to cancel that Cox Communications account because they're you know for 160 bucks a month, they will require that the person have legal authority to cancel that contract. The fact that you show that the person who had the contract has passed away would not be enough. And then a revocable living trust. What is it? That's a depending on its term. That's another way to pass assets. So um, uh, that's a, a way to put assets in a trust that allow you to um, avoid probate. So when the person passes away that you don't have to go through the court probate department. The other thing is that you can be a little bit more um, creative. So you can make, you know, in a will, it's difficult to have a lot of if then type statements about what would, you certainly can say to my children and if they have passed away then to their children. But, you know, if you wanna, for example, make sure that if you're a blended family and both you and your spouse have your own children, that you want to make sure that if you pass away uh, first, that your children will still be taken care of, that your spouse won't inherit everything and then give everything to his children. Um, so those kinds of um, things that are a little less straightforward, for lack of a better term, are much easier to accomplish in a trust. Um, a trust is also a good way to um, make allowances for a disabled beneficiary, including your spouse, to make sure that assets will be managed in that trust. That's that's another way to avoid conservatorship, frankly, if the assets are in a trust and there's a trustee who can manage that. Um, and you also, there's also the possibility in a trust, unlike a will, that the co-trustee or a successor trustee may be able to make some changes to the to the terms of that document if you say that you want to allow them to where you can't really do that in a will. And uh, we'll get into this a little bit more uh, down the road, but um, a revocable living trust is an excellent estate planning tool. It's not necessarily a good tool for qualifying for public benefits. And we'll talk about that next, but I wanted to stop just for a second after the estate planning to see if anyone had questions there. Just raise your hand. Yeah. Yeah. If you've got a question, type it into the chat. Nothing so far, Marsha. Okay. Um, so that, now this is sort of a transition. The first was the legal part and this is the financial part and they both have um so i wanted to bring an overview of public benefits that are available to assist someone with dementia and and their families and the and so medicare ssi or ssdi disability um va aid and attendance and altex which is medicaid in arizona so medicare as as um and I'm not going to make assumptions about who's on here. I'm on Medicare. It's health insurance for individuals over 65 or who have received um, Social Security disability benefit income for at least two years. Um, and as um, many of us uh, find out sometimes, it's sort of a rude awakening, Medicare does not provide the coverage for long-term care is limited to medical necessity. It's also not unlimited in duration. So if someone falls and breaks their hip, if they're in the hospital for a couple of days and then they need skilled care or skilled rehab, Medicare will pay for that for a period of time as long as it is medical ne medically necessary, but then they will be discharged from that environment. For someone who has um, dementia, and so the care that they need is not medical per se, it's more custo custodial, Medicare does not pay for that at all. Um, Social Security Disability Insurance, or this is income for individuals under age 65 who are permanently disabled. Um, and I have um, worked with many families who um, were diagnosed with early onset uh, um, dementia or Alzheimer's under the age of 65 who qualify for SSDI. 
Um, this is not means tested. In other words, it's not like Medicaid where you can only have so many assets. Um, this is based on what you have paid in the same way that it's a little different calculation, but the same idea as your retirement social security based on what's been paid in over a period of time. A calculation is made um, for your um, for social security disability income. It is um, slightly it tends to be more than what the retirement income is. So when you reach, when that person who's on SSDI reaches full retirement income, full retirement age, then they would be switched over to the uh, retirement income. And um, so, and that is so. That is an income stream. It's intended as income replacement because this is a person um, under age 65. Um, and actually, I, when I, I need to change my slide to under full retirement age, because you know that's changing these days. Whereas now it's um, depending on the, your year of birth, it's 66 or maybe even up to 67. Um, and um, so it's an income stream. And as I said, once you've been receiving Social Security SSDI for two years, then you are eligible for Medicare. Um, the exception to that is if someone is receiving SSDI because of a diagnosis of ALS then or a diagnosis of um, uh, acute renal failure, then there is not the two year waiting period for Medicare. Um, and SSDI is separate from SSI. SSI is um, a means tested benefit for people over 65 or disabled uh, people, adults under the age of 65. But they're not eligible for SSDI because they never um, contributed to the system. They didn't uh, put money into the system themselves. Um, and as an aside, so retirement income, a spouse who did not work outside the home can draw retirement, uh, Social Security retirement off of her spouse's um, income. That does not apply to SSDI. That's only if the person who's disabled has contributed to the system that it would be calculated just for them. So this is, as you can see, a, a minimal amount of income that's available as a safety net for someone who does not have other source of income. And it is, um, based on the couple's income. So SSI would not be available for a spouse who did not have um, her own income if her, if her spouse had a high income. Um, these benefits are what they call means tested. Um, they're reduced based on earned or unearned income, um, whereas SSDI is not. Um, and an individual eligible for one month of SSI is also eligible for access. So, um, Often the reason that some if someone had an accident and that's why they are eligible for SSI or a, a childhood um, disability, even if excuse me, even if they're the beneficiary of a trust or have funds available for their support, they had a wealthy family or um, I, I touched on the accident, someone who received a multi-million dollar settlement from an accident. Often those people will um, make arrangements uh, to protect assets in a special needs trust so that they can be eligible for SSI for the purpose of being eligible for access so that they can have some medical coverage. Um, the next one I want to touch on, and I know this is brief for all of these, is the um, VA Improved Pension Aid in Attendance. So this is a benefit that's available to a veteran who served during wartime or to the veteran's surviving spouse. Um, so the person does not need to have uh, seen action, have been overseas, um, could have been working at a desk in you know, Columbus, Ohio. Um, it's, it's the time periods. So they had to have been um, in active duty for um, at least 90 days, at least one of which was during wartime. We've lost almost all of our World War II vets, although we still have some of those. Um, but during the Korean conflict, um, then during the Vietnam War, um, and then now the, the Gulf uh, War, which started in um, 1990 for the original Gulf War under uh, President George Bush first, and really has never ended for this purpose. Um, and so this is a, as it says, that is means tested for income and assets. It's a benefit that's available. Um, so the first check the box, 
is um, did the person meet the time period? Did they serve during the required time period? And then they look at both income and assets. Um, so um, the maximum assets that a veteran can own um, is about $130,000, and that applies whether the veteran is single or married. That doesn't seem exactly fair to me. That the you know that it seems more generous for a single person than a married person. But regardless, that's the rule. Um, and then the income is a little bit of a sliding scale. So you'll see where um, the maximum benefit for a married veteran is in. Uh, 2021 is $2,266 a month. And so what they say is, let's look at the income of the veteran and or and his spouse. And we take that income and we subtract from that, this is a very rough estimate, the unreimbursed cost of care. So let's say a veteran and his wife have $4,000 a month in income, but one of the spouses needs to live in memory care that costs $5,000 a month. So if we subtract 5,000 from 4,000, their income for VA purposes is a negative number, and that veteran would be eligible for that maximum amount of the aid and attendance. And that may be enough. That may be enough to bridge the gap um, to, so that they don't need to look to Medicaid, that that person can get that care. It can also be a lesser amount than that. So let me, that same example where their income is $4,000, but they're paying $3,000 for a group home. Well, then their income for VA purposes is $1,000, and the benefit amount would be the difference between that and this maximum benefit amount. So what's wonderful about this benefit is that it is cash. And so there's no such thing of a, as a facility that does not accept the VA benefit. But, um, and th what's negative about it, or not as desirable, is that it is a maximum amount sort of no matter what. So it may not still be enough to cover the cost of care and allow the spouse to continue to, you know, pay bills and so forth. Um, and then I also always want to touch on, that's beyond our scope, but remember service-connected benefits for many chronic conditions. So now that many of the um, baby boomers are, you know, and the Vietnam generation are getting older, there, there are conditions, the one that comes to mind the most is Parkinson's disease and Parkinsonism that are proven to have been caused by exposure to Agent Orange. So if that veteran was in Vietnam and suffers from Parkinson's disease, then they would be eligible for service-connected benefits from the VA. That is, again, not means-tested. It's not taxable. And, you know, it's a recognition that someone with that condition has a cost of care um, that, the, that the government is going to help with. So. I always ask that question if someone comes to me, especially if we're already talking about um, VA benefits. You know, did you serve in Vietnam or Korea where they also um, uh, were exposed to Agent Orange? Uh, one thing I'm waiting for them to figure out um, what I'm sure that Jan and Candace would agree that folks who had the traumatic brain injuries in, especially in the Gulf War, are far more likely to develop dementia and that that dementia should be determined to be a service-connected um, um, condition. There's a lot of research and work on that, but that decision has not yet been made by the VA. So any questions about the VA benefits or the other ones I touched on briefly before? You guys are very quiet. Nothing in the oh, chat so far either. OK. And then finally, um, I wanted to talk about um, and I think I just have the one slide, but I'll talk a lot about it. Altex, Arizona long term care. So the Medicaid system in Arizona is called access and um, a subset, for lack of a better word, of that program is Altex. This is the program, the part of all access that assists with the cost of long-term care for individuals who require a nursing home level of care. So again, the diagnosis alone is not going to medically qualify someone for all tech. Excuse me, just one moment. Um, they need to also have a functional decline so that they can't function independently with their activities of daily living. So those activities of daily living are dressing, bathing, toileting, grooming, 
feeding oneself. So not preparing the meal, but but if the meal is placed in front of the person, can they, you know, get it to their mouth? Those those um, types of things. And so, um, unfortunately, very unfortunately, there is a big gray area between someone who clearly cannot live alone, who needs supervision, who can't manage their money, who can't drive, who can't, you know, who would be subject, very vulnerable if they were exposed, you know, trying to pay their own bills, but they are physically able to, to function, quote unquote, independently. So that person would not qualify for Altex, and I say yet. Now, fortunately, all text does recognize that dementia is a little different. That so someone may be physically able to go into the shower and stand there, but if that person needs a lot of prompting and um, and assistance, and yeah, they'll go. That's what they'll do too. They'll just go in the shower and stand there. They can't adjust the temperature of the water. They will not bathe, soap themselves. They will not rinse themselves. Then that person cannot independently bathe, and all text will recognize that, and you know, sort of make note um, that that person is unable to, um, to to care for him or herself. Um, but. Um, I just, again, folks will sometimes think that or want to apply for Altex. Um, and we, we, and certainly in my office, given as the attorney, focus a lot on the financial criteria, but we need to remember the medical criteria as well. And in fact, if I'm in a cynical mood, sometimes it seems that the medical criteria is that they're becoming increasingly strict with that, that the financial is pretty black and white. The rules are laid out. You meet them or you don't. Um, the medical is a little bit more subjective, and I'm finding that we are having to um, be very hands-on, and no pun intended, with the Altex application to make sure that, that they do a proper assessment of that person. They don't, now that they're doing those assessments um, on the telephone or by Zoom, they don't go to the home necessarily. I, I'm hoping that will open up again soon. Um, and so you, we can all imagine our loved one with dementia, who if you were to ask them, if they can do various things independently, they're going to say yes, even though we know it isn't true. And that that all text assessor is all very happy to take that person at their word and say, OK, they, they don't need it. So I wanted to start with that medical criteria. And then also that all text will provide care um, in a community setting, in a uh, group home, um, assisted living, a memory care. Um, all right, when I talked about the community, so let me take a step back. Um, in many states, and when Medicaid first started, the service could only be provided in a nursing home. I often say I'm not even sure what a nursing home is anymore, you know, because a skilled nursing or a skilled rehab is really not intended for long term custodial care. Um, but in these other states, my colleagues in Ohio have to argue basically every single time that memory care is more appropriate for this person with dementia than a nursing home is. So we're fortunate in that regard that the Arizona uh, rules recognize that. Um, and it also can, as I said, it can be provided at home um including by a spouse um so a family member can be compensated to if they're trained and they work through an agency uh can be compensated to provide care for that spouse um or a child can do that the care at home they will not pay for 24 7 care at home not that they're saying that you must go to a residential setting but if any of you have paid for um, non-medical home care at home, you know as, as, that when you get to that seven to eight hours a day, it starts to be more expensive to have care at home than it does in a residential setting. So Altex will say, you can stay at home if you have a family network, if you are able to make this work, we're just not going to pay for 24 seven at home. We're going to, you know, if you moved into a residential setting at that point, we would pay. Um, Altex is means tested for both income and assets. Um, the rules are different than, um, I'm going to check my question first to see if I'm, um, uh, the, the question that was asked, so I am going to go back. How can a family appeal the decision that a person is not Altex eligible? Um, if Altex deny, when Altex denies your application, you, um, you'll get that in writing. Uh, that describes why you were how you were found to not be um, eligible. 
And if it's medical, then it says that it was for medical reasons, you didn't meet the medical criteria. And at the end of that multi-page document that says you were found ineligible, there's a little half page form that says, I want to appeal. And you don't, and you fill that out and you send it in, you have 60 days so you can think about it. Um, and once you have sent that in, and the reason you were denied was because of medical, then they will provide to you the, the worksheet, for lack of a better word, that they used to determine that you didn't have enough points to qualify for all techs. And so with that tool in front of you, so let's use the example of the person who they unfortunately got on the phone, the actual uh, person with dementia, they talked to that person on the phone and made their decision. So you would say, you would look at that and say, well, that's absolutely not true. We have a caregiver coming in three days a week to help my father with his showers, you know. So it, you would basically, you would say that you did not have all of the information that you needed to make your decision. And um, so the first step when you appeal, excuse me, is a pre-hearing conference, which is basically a telephone call. And um, so when that is, so you've seen why the person didn't qualify, then you'll get a call to schedule that phone call. And most cases, if you're able to be successful um, reversing a decision that the person didn't qualify medically, you're going to accomplish that in the pre-hearing conference. So you will talk to the person who calls you. They're very kind. They really are. They're very compassionate and they will, um, and you'll say you, you didn't have all the information. I have medical records that show that they have advanced dementia. I have documentation of the care that's provided. They'll say, well, send it in. Um, we didn't have it. We should have had it. Send it in. Um, and they'll take the time that's needed um, now let, uh, um, to, to, for you to send that in and they'll look it over. One thing to decide um, is um, whether you want to appeal or if you want to do a new application. And let me explain the difference there. So an appeal is saying, as of the day that I applied, so I applied for all text for this person on February 1st, and then it was May 15th by the time you finally uh, gave me the decision. On February 1st, they did not qualify. I mean, February 1st, they met the medical criteria. You just missed the information. You didn't read what was available. Then you should appeal. If you think, you know what, probably in February this was accurate, but my loved one has um, declined a lot since then, and now for sure I have the documentation in, a, in hand, the person's living in memory care, I know, then it probably would take less time for you, and that's, you know, if you sort of accepted that denial and applied again. They have the information they have. You don't have to, you know, it goes much more quickly and you're not arguing at that point whether the person would have qualified back in February. You're giving them a nice clean package now that you know that they meet. So let me, and the next question that the person asked, that I'm gonna talk about something for a moment and then I'm gonna ask the question, which was um, how soon should someone apply for all tax? So when someone is single, um, the criteria are quite straightforward as far as assets. That person has to be down to $2,000 in countable assets, liquid or cash type assets. Um, so stocks, bonds, um, you know, retirement accounts, um, cash, money in the bank, those kinds of things. Um, your home is not counted as an asset up to a net equity value of about $600,000. And um, and one vehicle is not counted, but just for the sake of this conversation in sort of a group setting like this. So look at the cash, that single person has to be down to $2,000, but a married person, the community spouse, the, the, the spouse who is not receiving care is allowed to retain half of the countable assets up to a maximum of about $130,000. The same number we were using for VA as a matter of fact. So, um, that person comes to me, this, I had this person come this very week, where they were really hoping that mom could continue to be cared for at home and we're at the point where that's just not feasible for the very elderly husband as well. So this couple owns their home and they have a car and they have some life insurance policies with cash value because those count and they have about 
it, the number really struck in my mind because it was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars to be spent down. And so that person can keep half of that number up to a maximum of one hundred and thirty thousand. In his case, it's about the same number. You know, um, if I add those up, it was around two sixty. So one thirty is half of that. Um, and so what we would do is then you start a process called the community spouse resource assessment. You go to Altex and you say we want to we have one spouse who's who's well and lives in the community, one spouse who is going to need Altex. Altex, please tell us the value of assets that this the other spouse can keep. Now we know the answer before we started, but it needs to be in their books. You know, so they would look at this at these couple's assets and they would say, OK, they have the home, they have the life insurance, they can keep one hundred and thirty thousand. But so one of the ways that this couple in particular, I mean, this, you know, this is like a, a you know, a, a practice, a, an exam question for the certified elder law attorney exam because it just the numbers fit so perfectly. The amount owing on his mortgage is literally one hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So the way this gentleman is going to spend down is as soon as they say you have to spend one hundred and thirty thousand dollars, we've already discussed he's going to pay down, pay off the mortgage because remember the house is not counted, but that cash is. But I don't do it yet. Because if he spends that money now and he only has 130,000 of countable assets, then they'll say you can only keep half of that. You have to spend down to 65,000. So the time to start the application when it's a married couple for that community spouse resource assessment is when the person meets the f medical criteria. So, for example, you know, my husband and I couldn't say, hey, let's get that community spouse thing out of the way. So if one of us ever needs Medicaid, we'll know what the number is. No, somebody does need to medically qualify for the benefit. But really, as soon as you are thinking that you may need to look to Altex, is the time to do that first part of the application, the community spouse resource assessment. There's no time limit for the spend down. I worked with a couple once where they had a piece of property out of state. Um, they we started the community spouse thing. They told us what the figure was. Um, it, they it took a while to sell the house and they sold that. It, it was about three years. But still, when that money was spent down, we didn't have to go through the two step process. We could just start the application um, so that she could get the funds for her husband. Um, I want to touch on many people will to us th there's also criteria for income and there's a maximum income that the person can earn i don't worry so much about the income and it's the, for income although they use the assets of both spouses for income they use what's called the name on the check so my new client it's the wife who needs the care she never did work outside the home so her social security is about eight hundred dollars a month it's half of the amount that her husband's was when he retired he has uh, a large amount of social security he has a quite a generous pension from where he used to work i think his income is probably close to four thousand dollars in his name doesn't matter we're applying for her they look only at her income now let's say it was um the situation was reversed um, and it was the husband with the higher income who was um, going to apply. So the first thing Altex would do is they would say, OK, the income in, in um, Mr. Jones's name is too high. Let's add his and his wife's together, divide by two. Is it still too high? And the number is about twenty two thirty a month. If it is still too high or if the person again is single and so there's nobody to split it with, if you will, um, then there is a vehicle called a Miller Trust. And that is a, a very specific trust instrument, the sole purpose of which is used to place a sum or all of a person's income so that income is not counted by Medicaid. And then that person will not be counted as being over income. And the income that goes into that trust still has to be used toward their share of cost, but at least they can qualify for benefits because many is the time that person will be fifty dollars twenty dollars i'm not kidding over there's no you know over that limit and so they can't qualify um so that excess income sure as heck is not enough to pay for care but they um so that can be worked around 
um, many people, and that does, if that doesn't make sense, it's because it doesn't make sense. But, you know, in California, very seldom do we in Arizona say that something they do in California makes more sense. But they are not an income cap state. They say if you meet the asset requirements, even if your income is higher, but it's not enough to pay for care, we'll just, you know, we can move forward and you can qualify for Medicaid, but that's not the case here. But many of the time people will say, you know, I know I need a Miller Trust. What they think they, that they don't. They don't need a Miller Trust. You cannot put other assets in that Miller Trust. It really is used, and you certainly would never create one until the exact moment that you need it because you're putting your income in this trust and you no longer really have access to it. So that's fine if the income is going in and passing right back out again to pay for your memory care, but you certainly wouldn't want your income accumulating there for several years before you qualify for all tax. And that is my last, if you will, substantive slide. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions, any more questions about all text or. I don't see any. Feel and free so, to just raise your hand or type a question in the chat. And um, my last slide, which you guys have is, as I mentioned, a list of resources. So that very first, I think my email address actually was on the first slide. And then that um, very first is my page on my firm's web page. You can also, uh, there's a, a contact form at that, um, that page if you'd like to contact me there. And then these are just a number, goodness knows there are um, tons and tons of um, resources out there on the internet. Those are just some that sort of came to mind. And then I just saw another question. Let me get this other thing off my screen. Um, the person asked, how hard is it to apply for all text without an attorney? And this is a friend of mine asking that. So, you know, I mean, there are people who apply for all text without an attorney. I am not going to say that it is necessary to have an attorney, but I will say that especially in the spousal situations, um, it's very challenging to do it on your own. And um, there are many wonderful people who work for all text, but their job title is not customer service representative. Their job title is eligibility specialist. They work for the agency. And so they are not going to, um, you know, sort of tell you, guide you through how to apply. Or often, I, many, many people will come to me and say, I applied for Altex and it was denied. And they say, I need a Miller Trust. And they probably do. But they, there's also in that situation because um, the Altex agency understands the need for it. But there, then there'll be like five other things that, that the Altex person didn't mention because they got to that over income question and then they stopped. You know, but let's get all this other stuff squared away at the same time too. So um, I, I, um, it, it would I. It would be very challenging for someone without an attorney, I think, to qualify for all things, especially um, um, the spousal situation. And then the other thing, I think that the other thing that an attorney gets to do is if for you as a as a normal person, <laughs> you maybe you did this once for one other parent or one person, but um, but you don't necessarily have that frame of reference because guess what? The folks who work for Altex, they have a high turnover. They don't always know what they're talking about either. And so, whereas like in my office and any other elder law attorney, we have that frame of reference. So if the Altex person says, this happened to me just yesterday, well, you need to do such and such. Um, like, depending on the time of day, my degree of professionalism, this was late in the day and I'm like, no, you don't. And, you know, they hemmed and they hawed. And I said, the policy is such and such and such and such. I type, type, type. I can hear them in the background. Oh, yeah, you're right. And, you know, it's just because I have done this enough other times to know what the policy is and so forth. So that absolutely is what you get when you work with a professional to help you with that. And then another question um, is, um, are there limited facilities that accept payment from Altex? Thank you so much. Yes. So Altex is... The analogy is, 
depending on your health insurance, not every doctor takes your health insurance. And, you know, and, and I'm still employed and, you know, so I, you find yourself in that situation of having to change doctors because the company changed its health insurance plan. Similarly, not every community accepts payment from all tax. Many do, a skilled nursing does, a hospital always will. Um, many do. Um, but so, and many of the ones that you would choose because you have a good feeling about it for your loved one do, but but many do not. And many of those that do um, require that the person be paid privately for a period of time before they what they call roll over as onto all tax. Now, the reason for that is, again, using your health insurance as an analogy, we've all seen those bills where they say the cost of this procedure was $80,000, but your insurance will pay 10, so we'll take 10. You know, so the facility that accepts payment from all tax accepts a smaller amount of reimbursement than the private pay rate. So they need to balance their census. You know, they need to make sure they have enough private pay residents so that they can assure good care for everyone, the same, you know, the same for the people on Altex who are not. So they'll want someone to pay private leave for sometimes a year, sometimes two years before they let them roll over onto Altex. Now I used to say, if it's two years, but you've been there for 18 months and you run out of money, they probably won't kick you out. Um, I still mostly believe that, except I am seeing more and more facilities include that specific duration in their contract, that they won't accept payment from Altex until um, the person has been there for the two years. So you wanna calculate that um, when you choose a facility like that. Or if you're looking at facilities, one of the questions, if you think Altex is even possible, one of your criteria, um, your checklist of what's important to you should be, do you accept payment from Altex? Because you certainly don't want to move your loved one into a facility and then have to move them again for, if you will, an artificial reason, a reason unrelated to their care. Um, as far as having a family member be paid uh, by Altex, you can, um, except that that family member needs to be paid through an agency that accepts payment from Altex. So, I mentioned this one uh, non-medical home care agency only because I know for a fact that they do accept payment from Altex and that's Cypress Home Care here in the Valley. And so they will, so the person has to be, the person goes on their payroll, if you will. They have to be trained, which nothing wrong with that. They'll require that they be trained in how to, you know, handle someone with dementia. And then you'll get, it'll almost like be like you're getting a paycheck from that agency. Um, but that assures that there's all the proper insurance in place and so forth. And there, and as I said, there are other uh, non-medical home care agencies who do the same. All takes used to just sort of pay the caregiver. If any of you have children who are developmentally disabled, and so a DDD will pay a family care caregiver, the process is different for that. They those DDD will make direct payments. All takes no longer does. Um, the question is, if someone is on Altex, can they receive hospice care? Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, um, if someone is on hospice, um, the medical, uh, the, it's almost an automatic approval on the medical side. Um, the, being on Altex does not really have an impact on the medical care that you are entitled to. Another benefit of Altex is that you're automatically el eligible for access as your secondary. So if you're on Medicare and you're paying for a secondary, um, you could choose at that point to not have that ongoing expense of your secondary policy and go on access, or you could have Medicare, your secondary access as the third to pick up uh, deductibles and co-pays. Um, and that's a choice you can make at the time, but you absolutely can are eligible and entitled to hospice. And let me... Um, and someone asked, Jan Doherty asked, what do life care planning attorneys do that's different from an elder law attorney? So my practice, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm a life care planning law firm. And so I have care coordinators on my staff. I have two. I have an RN and I have a, um, an MSW, a social worker. Um, and so if someone engages our firm for what we call life care planning, then we do what we we say we help you with everything to find, get, and pay for the care you need. So as a good so the, so if you came to me and you wanted to apply for you know one spouse 
really needs to be looking at care. The care coordinator would work with you on selecting that care, um, on supervising that care. If someone is in a residential placement, the care coordinator makes un, um, unannounced visits to that facility. Um, if you need to sort of, if advocacy is required, if they're not, doing everything that they might do for your loved one, then that, you know, the care coordinator gets to be, does is the bad guy. You don't have to be the bad guy and worry that, um, well, first of all, that's exhausting. Second of all, you don't want them to take, you know, you don't want to be the bad guy and maybe they're going to take it out on your loved one, which would be extremely unprofessional, but that's a natural concern. And, you know, sometimes it isn't even, you don't, I mean, it doesn't require a sort of, legal intervention if an example is early on in covid one of our clients um has dementia but he was quite high functioning he lived in memory care he was able to converse with family members on facetime as long as somebody you know, dialed it and set it up for him and so the facility was helping him and then all of a sudden in covid they're like well we can't help uh mr smith with um facetime because of covid and I'm like, you know, you're giving me a headache. I said, so I'm looking at Mr. Smith's care plan and he needs assistance with showering. Are you still helping him with his showering? Yes. So I don't understand why you are able to have someone basically put your hands on his naked body and help him in the shower, but someone else can't hold up the iPad. Oh, I see what you mean. But again, for the family, you're just so in the middle of it and often so exhausting, whereas that's the type of, you know, so I use that as an example of advocacy that isn't quote unquote legal, but I, I hope that it really did help this gentleman and his family and their quality of life. Or sometimes you do need to appeal the denial of benefits or some of those other kinds of things that, so it's a little bit more of a wraparound service for lack of a better term than, um, than just, the quote unquote, just the legal, the legal documents and the benefits applications. Any other questions? So is that a backdrop or are you really in front of those beautiful flowers? That's <laughs> Okay, so the very, and then finally, I'm going to turn it back to Candace um, for this. Thanks, Marsha. What's on the screen now is just a little information on um, City of Tempe Memory Cafe or virtual. Um, we have a caregiver support group on the first and third Monday of each month. And if you want more information, you can give me a call or you can send me an email. Um, if you would like um, the PDF, which is actually attached in the chat, but if you'd like me to send you a copy of the PDF of the PowerPoint and a link to the uh, video recording, just type your uh, name and email address into the chat and I can absolutely do that. Um, that kind of concludes our Dementia Friendly Presents session. Uh, thank you, Marsha, for doing an amazing job with the presentation. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us and wish you a, a very pleasant rest of your day. I'm gonna leave the chat open for just a little bit in case yes. people do wanna include their email address, but um, that, that pretty much concludes our session.